Hi students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian and I'm streaming to you live from beautiful Victoria here on the west coast of Canada. I hope everybody is having a great day thus far and is staying healthy, staying strong and being productive. Today in this uh, class everyone we are doing a reading and we're going to talk about uh, how to uh, uh, do the exam so that you can get that maximum band 9 score. This is a members chat class. Everybody is welcome to watch. We will be discussing a list of heading strategies in detail and um, looking at a passage from our practice exams. Uh, welcome Nico, welcome members. Good to have many of you on board. Uh, students, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Visit us there for the general IELTS. Check us out at gieltshelp.com on both of those websites. We have lots and lots of materials. This is a reading class, so make sure to read uh, with me. Don't just listen. That's good for listening practice, but of course for reading, you want to do some reading as well. Uh, hi, Saga. <laughs> nice. I hope you enjoy that uh, breakfast sandwich. Um, all right, everyone, I'll, I'll show you our websites real quick. We have audio for our readings as well, which makes our courses quite unique. So uh, you can join our premium package by clicking on that big red button. It is a one-time payment for lifetime access. We are a British Council IELTS Registration Center and certified agents. Um, we have... Uh, Six full practice exams, of course, with three reading passages each. We are looking at an academic reading passage. Of course, this is our academic YouTube channel. Uh, for general IELTS reading, check us out at gieltshelp.com. Uh, the green background like this. Uh, again, you can click that big red button to join our premium package there. Hi, Rashika. Welcome to the class. Um, just a quick reminder for everybody, do check out our Instagram uh, profiles. We have some really cool information and uh, updates there for you. Um, for the academic, it's IELTS underscore AE help. And for the general, it's G IELTS help. So definitely have a peek at those Instagram uh, profiles and you'll get lots of cool tips and tricks for the exam. We keep adding new information there. If you have questions, then you can always send me an email, adrian at aehelp.com, and I will gladly uh, respond to your inquiries. So we have uh, reading right now, and then we'll have listening parts one and two for uh, the all chat class where everybody will be able to join in on the uh, chat. For now, uh, let's go to reading. Uh, so reading is... Uh, quite challenging for many learners um, and there are a lot of uh, different uh, ideas about how to get a perfect score. I did do the exam, the official exam, I did get a perfect score uh, with the reading techniques that I'm teaching to you in this class as well. Uh, basically you have to apply good active reading skills with appropriate strategy. Uh, so no skimming and scanning for answers or looking for keywords only. Uh, that's partially going to help you, but it will not be enough for a band nine. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, so uh, this uh, right now that is uh, reading passage two, and uh, it's coming from our first exam. If you want to uh, hear the audio for this reading and you have access to our premium package, it's CD1 track six. It's good to practice uh, that. All right. Saga, cool. I like how you subscribe to the Instagram. Fantastic. All right, everyone. So um, here we go. When you uh, are doing a reading, your first step always is to look at the title. Okay. So when you get to the reading section, step number one, look at the title of each of the passages quickly and see which one you find is going to be the easiest that means you know lots of information about it. It could be your major, it could be related to your hobby, uh, maybe the part of the world that you live in. So let's, for example, say that one of the passages is about the Himalayas and you live in India, you know lots about the Himalayas. Uh, it might make sense to start with that passage. So uh, pick the passage. Usually uh, 
passage one is the easier passage. Passage two is more challenging than passage three. And uh, then, of course, once you read the title, you want to begin visualizing and you want to apply some critical thinking and some prediction. Uh, that means you want to ask, okay, what is this passage about? Um, why is the author maybe writing about this? How does it work? Okay, um, so let's do that right now. Let's read this title and see what's going on. So seismic shifts, silent drifts. Hmm, what could that be? I don't know about you, but for me, that's a little bit mysterious. So seismic shifts, I have an idea of what it is, but that's definitely some advanced vocabulary. And silent drifts, well, again, that's quite mysterious. Okay, so we're not getting a lot of information from this title, but worry not. Our second step is to look at the questions, okay? And hopefully the questions will give us a little bit greater insight into the information in the passage. So list of headings um, is the only question that has some false uh, information because you will not use all of these uh, choices, okay? Uh, however, it's the only one that you should read before the passage, okay? So list of headings, read it before the passage, all right? Everybody clear on that? Um, that's why the IELTS gives you this question before the passage uh, in your paper-based exam. Uh, in your computer-based exam, you have all the questions on the side of the screen, so it doesn't really matter. But in the paper-based exam, you clearly have this question before uh, your reading passage because the examiners are indirectly suggesting that you read this question. Why is that? Why is it a good idea, members, to read this question uh, before you read the passage? What's the logic here? Okay, so let me challenge you with this question. Okay, so reading strategy. A list of headings. So read it before the passage because these choices indicate what? What do they indicate? So Saga says to understand the topic more. Uh, sure, but why is that? So why do we understand the topic more when we read these uh, list of headings choices, even though some of them are actually false and confusing. Okay, so why is that? Why do we get a deeper understanding? There's a very logical answer to my question here. Rashika, Nico, any ideas of why that is? Can anybody tell me that? Hmm? The reason why, because these choices indicate what each paragraph may be about. In other words, the topic of each paragraph, okay? So, and you clearly have that. I mean, it's in the question. Um, so, but it's indirect, right? So it says, choose the correct heading for paragraphs A, C, uh, D, G, D to G uh, from the list of headings below. It means that you're basically choosing a title or the title of each paragraph. So if the paragraph were on its own, a little mini essay, what would be uh, the actual uh, title of that paragraph. OK, 
Okay, so that's why it gives you a lot more help because it doesn't deal with examples or explanations, but it deals with the topic of each paragraph. Okay, so let's do this. Um, let's read these. Okay, um, the first one, violent eruptions, magma, lava, and new islands. Okay, so um, how can you paraphrase that? When you're reading these, when you're practicing these, you should always try to paraphrase these list of headings, okay? That's a very important tip, and you should actually do that in your mind during the exam as well. So a list of headings choices should be paraphrased on paper at home practicing before the exam. and in your mind during the exam. Because that is the way you will see it, or it should say see the information in the text. Okay? So here, um, when we read this, violent eruptions, magma, lava, new islands, uh, what word comes to mind? So how can you paraphrase that? What comes to mind? Okay, there's one word <laughs> that can paraphrase uh, all of what we're reading here, especially if you're thinking about here, violent eruptions, right? What is that? Yeah, very good, Prathamesh, volcano. Yeah, that's what comes to mind for me as well. So here, volcano, right? All right, Rashika says the same. Ah, it's, it's a volcano. Um, yeah, I agree. It is a volcano. Okay. Um, the destruction of Pompeii. Now, if you know what Pompeii is, great. If not, uh, you might not be able to do paraphrase so well, but Pompeii is an ancient city. So, um, the uh, damage or the um, end of a city, okay, something like that. Uh, two continents become many, uh, land masses split apart. Okay, um, fossil evidence, proof from dinosaur bones, okay, um, adjacent continents, land masses beside each other, and so on. Okay, so you're just going um, like this. Uh, try this one. Let's do one more. So you did the first one, you do the last one. An intuitive notion. How would you uh, paraphrase that? By the way, Rashika, demolish is a really good word for destruction. So demolishing a city. That would be good. Okay, good for you for thinking of that. Um, an intuitive notion. Notion is an idea. Intuitive is logical. Um, logical idea. How could you paraphrase that? Okay. Uh, random notice is not because intuitive saga is not random. Intuitive means that it's logical. It's probable. It's possible. Okay. So <clears throat> notion, idea. So how could you paraphrase that one? An intuitive notion. There's actually one word that will paraphrase that. Think of science when somebody has an intuitive notion. There are actually a couple words from science that will paraphrase that. Okay, so a logical idea would be okay for two words. And a logical idea is also called, not quite a fact, Rashika, think a little bit before that. So before we prove that it's a fact, what is it? When it's a proven idea, it becomes a fact. Okay, Saga says a scientific interest. Saga, there's another way you could say scientific interest 
or scientific idea. Think about it. Once I tell you, you're probably thinking, oh, maybe I don't know this word, but I bet when I tell you, you're going to say, oh, yeah, of course, I knew that word. So this is why practice is so important because when you practice, these words come to your mind faster, and that's for anybody. That's for native and non-native English speakers, okay? So the word that I'm thinking of starts with an H, or the other one I'm thinking of starts with a T. Anybody know what it is? An intuitive notion. Okay. Well, an intuitive notion, if you're sitting in a university class, could be called a hypothesis or a theory. Okay. Did you know those words? I bet you did. Okay, so a hypothesis or a theory uh, would be an intuitive notion. Okay, so if you see gray clouds, the air is starting to get cool, there's more wind, you get the intuitive notion uh, that uh, it's going to rain, right? Or you have a theory or a hypothesis that it's going to rain, right? That's an intuitive notion, all right? Um, okay, so uh, you'll get it next time, uh, Saga. No worries. So that's what it is. Okay, so you want to go through it like that. The Ring of Fire uh, is a geographic area with lots of volcanoes. Uh, the Invisible Threat, it's an unseen danger. Uh, Gondwana comes together. Okay, a hypothesis of unity and disunity. An intuitive notion of oneness or many pieces. A mechanism to match the theory is found. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, now we have a lot more ideas about what this paragraph might be about. So I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, okay, uh, there's going to be some information about geography, continents, uh, movement of continents, the creation of continents with lava, magma, and, uh, and the likes. So now uh, you can go to the remaining questions and uh, have a look at those. True, false, not given. Don't worry about those. Don't read those. Absolutely just a waste of time. In fact, it's uh, counterintuitive uh, to read these. They can be just really confusing. So, And then we have complete each sentence with the correct ending A to F below. So here we have to complete these three statements. Uh, with some choices from A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, there's three half sentences and six choices. So it means 50% of these choices are wrong. Uh, don't read these choices because you could be reading a lot of false and unnecessary information uh, that's confusing. And you don't need to do that. So just read the information that is actually somewhere in the text. Uh, number 24, plate tectonics result in mountains, volcanoes, and. Uh, so the movement of continental plates uh, results in uh, these giant wrinkles in the land, the mountains, these big eruptions of lava, and something else. Okay, volcanoes result from the difference in. Okay, so lava um, activity on the surface of the earth is created from uh, some kind of a variance, okay? A tsunami can result from a slip. So a giant wave um, is caused by the slip in something, all right? So again, I'm paraphrasing here as much as I can because that will help me to digest the reading more and it will also help me to select better answers, okay? All right, so again, if this seems difficult, don't worry, it comes with practice, uh, let's see, do we have any more? Nope, it's passage three. So now we go back and read, okay? And uh, when I did my IELTS exam about a month ago, I had uh, this type of question. So I had a passage where there were uh, half of the questions were list of headings questions, and I did exactly what I'm showing you right now, and I ended up with a band nine in my reading, so that means I got them all right or maybe just wrong in the entire reading section. Um, so... I'm sure that it works, okay? It was my theory before I sat the exam and it became fact, Rashika, after the exam, right? Um, so 
Uh, here we go. Let's read this together. This is reading, so read with me. And uh, provided that you have the chance, you're at home in your uh, house studying or out in a park, uh, read aloud. Okay? So if you're at your workplace, that might be a little bit difficult. Um, but read aloud. Okay? Uh, Saga, no. One passage will not have 15 to 16 questions. I have never seen that. The most I've seen is 14 to a passage. Uh, so, but you never know. I'll sometimes we'll do things a little bit differently. So they could do like 12, 13, and 15, I guess. I've never seen 15. I usually see uh, 13 to 14 per passage. Okay. All right. Um, so here we go. Uh, let's read. Again, you don't have to rush. Rushing is not good. So in the reading, it's uh, the turtle. Slow and steady wins the race. You have to read and understand. If you're reading so fast and you're so nervous that you don't understand anything that you're reading, then there's no point to reading. Okay, so uh, don't do that. All right. Um, here we go. Let's do this together. So when looking at a map of the world, it is natural to notice that Africa and South America seem to be able to fit together as if they are two parts of a former whole. It was this insight uh, which led Flemish cartographer Abraham Ortelius in 1596 to put forward for the first time the idea that at one period the continents were in different places than they are today. It would take over 300 years for the theory to be fully developed and 50 years after that uh, for the mechanism of the phenomenon to be discovered. Um, so now uh, to find the correct answer for list of headings, we want to ask ourselves a very important question. What is this paragraph primarily, mainly about? So what is this paragraph primarily or mainly about? Okay, after you read a paragraph, ask yourself, what is this paragraph primarily, which means mainly, about? And then answer it, of course. So how would you answer that in a clear, concise way? So the trick here is that you have to give a clear and precise answer. So how would you give a, so what would you give as a clear and a precise answer for this? So what is this paragraph about? Answer this for me in a clear and precise way. This paragraph that we just read, okay? Now, it's good to be visual, so we're looking at a map of the world, so picture a map of the world, and uh, it looks like Africa and South America kind of fit together like puzzle pieces, so we can see that, and uh, it was this insight, this realization, that this Flemish cartographer, Abraham Ortelius, in 1596 said, hey, Maybe, just maybe, a long time ago, uh, these continents, these big pieces of land that we're discovering and drawing here, uh, they were in different places. They, they were maybe connected to each other or kind of like a puzzle. Um, and then it would take 300 more years for this theory. Now, we paraphrase that, right? Um, what was the paraphrase in the... Uh, list of headings. And this is where that's very valuable. So I want to show you the value of paraphrasing uh, in the list of headings. So um, what was the paraphrase? Anybody remember? So this is where you got to test your reverse thinking, right? So what did you read before? Okay. So this theory to be fully developed in 50 years after that for the mechanism to be discovered. So how it happened. Uh, yeah, very good. So Nico uh, helped you out there, Saga. So an intuitive uh, notion, right? Uh, insight, theory, intuitive. Um, so if I ask myself the question, uh, what is this paragraph about? Um, example here for paragraph A would be uh, it's about a clever idea 
or realization by a, a map maker in 15, I think it was 96. Maybe I'm a little bit off, but that's okay, right? So a cartographer is somebody who makes maps. Uh, yeah, 1596, look at that. I remembered it correctly, right? So, yeah, so it was that intuitive idea. Okay, so I go back, and again, this seems easy because we're doing it together, but it does take practice, everyone. Okay, you've got to practice this. So here, I'm going to look to see which one of these matches with this clever recognition, okay, or clever realization of this map maker. So violent eruptions, nope, nope, nope. Nope, nope. That one looks absolutely great. A uh, ring of fire. Nope, nope. Um, a hypothesis of unity and disunity. Um, that kind of looks okay, but uh, it's maybe not precise enough yet. So it could be 10. It could be 5. Now, at this point, I'm just going to mark, uh, sorry, 6. I'm going to mark six, but I'm going to keep my eye on 10 as well. So I'm not going to forget about that, but I think six looks the best. So I'm going to mark six, okay? And then I'm going to move on to paragraph B, all right? Uh, and I'm going to repeat the same steps. So I'm going to read paragraph B ask what is it about, give a clear, concise answer. Concise means short and accurate answer, and then we'll move on. So here we go, B. It was not until 1915 that German geologist Alfred uh, Wiegener uh, proposed the continental drift theory, which states that the Earth's crust is made up of many sections that float slowly over the molten mantle and core of the Earth. Wigner argued that in the past, continents were all stuck together. He called this supercontinent Pangaea, uh, which is Greek for all Earth. Wigner hypothesized that approximately 200 million years ago, this supercontinent began to break up and the pieces began to move away from each other. Okay, um, so uh, now I ask myself, what is this paragraph about? Uh, this paragraph is about a more specific theory of this German geologist, Alfred Wiegner, hundreds of years later, uh, 1915. We're all the way into fairly modern times. Um, so it's, uh, so again, concise answer. So it's a hypothesis that uh, the uh, surface of the earth where people walk uh, used to be one kind of supercontinent and that split into many continents. It's an idea for that. So Saga says uh, breaking up uh, a supercontinent, and it's the idea for that. Okay, so we go back, and now I don't have to do too much searching here, okay? You don't want to keep looking at all of the possible choices every time. Whenever possible, you want to be more specific because I remember for the first one, I was thinking, okay, an intuitive notion or a hypothesis of unity and disunity. And now I can tell that 10 is the better answer uh, for this one. Okay. Yeah. So Nico agrees. Um, so it is a hypothesis of unity and disunity. And um, I wasn't intending to trick you by any means here, but that's our example paragraph. Okay. It's paragraph B. It's X. So now we're like, okay, definitely um, A is going to be VI. So we have a lot more confidence now in our first answer also, okay? Now, in the IELTS exam, don't be surprised that usually the example answer for the list of headings is going to be either the first or second body paragraph. Does anybody know why they do that? So does anybody know why they don't give you, they used to, if you look at um, like the very first IELTS exams, uh, Cambridge books, one, two, three, four, five, uh, they used to give you um, the first paragraph as the example uh, answer. 
But now they stopped doing that in the last few years. And now they always do the first or second body paragraph and not the introduction. Anybody know why that is? So anybody know why IELTS does not give you uh, a sample answer for the introduction? There is a reason for that. So IELTS, uh, people, uh, the people making these exams are quite clever. So they, they don't do such uh, steps on by accident. There is logic to their, uh, or reason to their decision. Yeah, so Saga says the first one is more difficult. Yeah, and Saga, you're right in some sense. Yeah, it is. So uh, the first one and the last one uh, are often more difficult because the first paragraph, of course, is the introductory paragraph. And the last paragraph is the conclusion. And one of the tricks uh, that a lot of students started to learn from the internet and from some courses is that for list of headings, you just need to read the first sentence and then uh, you get the idea. So it wasn't until 1915 that German geologist Alfred Wigner proposed the continental drift theory, which states that the Earth's crust is made up of many sections um, and that they were all stuck together. So you can, in the body paragraphs, oftentimes you can get the answer from the first one or two sentences. That is true, okay? Because in many, many of the body paragraphs, the answer to the what question comes first. It's not always true, so be careful, but oftentimes it does come from the first one or two sentences in body paragraphs. Now, that's not true for introductions and conclusions. For introductions and conclusions, the idea, the main idea, comes from the whole paragraph, and it could be from the end of the paragraph as well. Everybody clear on that? Okay, so when people were taking the IELTS in the early 2000s, what they would do for list of headings is, oh, great, they gave me the sample answer for this one, and then for B, C, D, I just need to read the first sentence and find the match, and off I go, Bob's your uncle, I'm happy. Um, okay, but uh, now you don't have that much of an opportunity because uh, you don't get the introduction anymore as the example, okay? So they got a little bit more tricky with it, and the IELTS wants students to read the whole passage and paragraph uh, to understand it. Okay, is that clear? Did that that make sense? That explanation. I know that was quite a complex explanation of why they did that, but that's the reason. Okay, that's the logical reason behind it. All right. Um, so looking good. Uh, let's go on uh, to uh, C. Here we go, everyone. So initially, Pangaea divided into two parts named Laurasia and Gondwana. Uh, Laurasia consisted of what is today North America, Asia, and Europe, whilst Gondwana uh, comprised modern-day South America, Africa, and Australia. These supercontinents eventually split apart further, resulting in today's continental configuration. It is interesting to note that today's continental alignment is just that. Millions of years in the future, the Earth's continents will appear very different. Uh, given enough time, it is possible that the Earth's land masses will return to a Pangaea-like unified state. Okay, perhaps. Um, so what is this about? Nice and quick, members. Uh, what is this paragraph about? So we've got Pangaea, then it breaks into two, Laurasia, Gondwana. Then we have Laurasia breaking into more pieces. We have Gondwana breaking into more pieces. So what is this paragraph about in your own words? Okay, nice and fast. Let's find the answer. Let's move along. Okay, time is of the essence. Saga says two parts of Pangaea. Uh, not just two parts, Saga, because there's more parts, right? So it's two parts of Pangaea, and then it's many parts of uh, those two parts, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so Saga says splitting of continents, so splitting of bigger land pieces. Yeah, uh, Prathamesh exists. Split, uh, sorry, Prathamesh agrees. Uh, splitting of continents, yeah. So we go back, and we go, all right, 
so which one says that continents become many more uh, pieces here? So, okay, uh, da, 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 da. Um, the best one, number three, two continents become many. Um, yeah, I agree. Okay, so number um, number three, definitely. Careful with the uh, spelling of two always students, Rashik. It's not toe, it's two, T-W-O. Okay, toe is a different word. All right, good. So we put number three uh, for... Uh, C in our answer key, and we are off to the races. All right. Okay, let's keep rocking and rolling here. Paragraph D. Um, the evidence for continental drift is plentiful. The most common evidence is the discovery of the same type of dinosaurs in extremely different locations. The same type of dinosaur fossil will be found in northeastern parts of South America as well as northwestern parts of Africa. The logical explanation for phenomena such as this is that at one time these parts of the world were not only connected but adjacent. Means they were side by side. Okay, adjacent means side by side. Um, so if I have to summarize this uh, dinosaur fossil, I would say that uh, the bones of dinosaurs show evidence that these land masses are connected. Everybody agrees? Bones of dinosaurs show evidence that continents were um, connected, right? Okay. So here. I'm looking for these dinosaur bones, uh, violent eruptions. Nope, nope. Hey, fossil evidence. So proof from dinosaur bones, uh, fossil evidence. Rashika agrees with me. Thank you, Rashika. Um, and uh, Prathamesh says, yeah, that's got to be number four. That makes sense. Okay, so the more you do this and the more you go along, uh, the better you're going to be. All right. Um, a lot of students panic. Uh, and they don't follow strategy because they think that they're going to run out of time. And I'm going to tell you something interesting, okay? So many students do not follow strategy during their official IELTS because they panic that they will run out of time. And I can empathize with that because when I did my IELTS exam uh, and I was doing the reading section, I realized that, yeah, okay, when you have this pressure and you have the three passages, the time seems to go really fast. So it's very nerve wracking. It's uh, very intense to kind of go slowly and be like, oh, I'm only on like question three and so much time has passed. But you have to keep in mind that the more you do it, the more questions you answer, the faster you go. So many students do not follow strategy during their official outs because they panic that they will run out of time. Um, however, and this is a really, really important tip. However, it is important to keep in mind that even though you may start uh, slowly with the first few answers, you will be faster with the uh, latter answers, okay? That's because of logic and because um, correct answers especially help you to figure out other answers faster. Does everybody get what I'm saying there? That's a really important tip. It's true for all of your reading passages. So it's true for your multiple choice, uh, for your list of headings and so on. Okay, so even if it takes you two, three times uh, more time uh, to figure out the answer for the first few, don't worry because on the back end, you're going to make that up, okay? So you're going to make up that lost time. You're going to be much faster later on because the information will become clearer and clearer and you'll know faster and faster what's there and what to answer, okay? Prathamesh says, yes, got it, okay? That's a really, really important tip, okay? So Saga, keep calm and stay the course, okay? Stay the path 
of strategy, just remember that you will become faster and faster for later questions, okay? All right, especially when you start answering them correctly, okay? So here we go. E, the evidence for continental drift was discovered long before an explanation for it was found. It was during the 1960s that the theory of plate tectonics was developed. This new theory explained fully the nature of the Earth's crust, that it was broken up into many pieces that tended to smack into each other and pull apart from each other. In extreme cases, such as the Indian subcontinent, a plate's movement can be so severe that it causes massive mountains to be formed when the plate hits another. This is precisely what has happened over the past millions of years with the Indian plate colliding with the Eurasian plate in the process creating the Himalayas, uh, which include the tallest mountain on Earth, Mount Everest. Okay, uh, what is this paragraph about? Very visually, it is about the mechanism or the system that creates the movement of continents. So there are these big plates and they keep shifting and moving uh, with time as the Earth is uh, rotating on its axis and spinning around the sun. So it's the system. It's the mechanism for it. Okay. All right. So here, vile interruptions, destruction of a city. No, two continents, fossil evidence, intuitive notion, ring of fire, invisible threat. Gondwana comes together. Not really. Hypothesis already used for the given example. A mechanism to match the theory is found. That looks great. I just said the system to explain the movement of the continents. Um, that looks like a great fit with XI, and I can tell that Honey agrees with that as well. So that's the right answer. So for this paragraph, I put in XI. Oh, that was a bit fast. Um, so I put in XI uh, for E, and then I move on to uh, paragraph F, and I can see that everybody else is on the same page. That's fantastic. So <clears throat> here we go with paragraph F. Uh, plate tectonics are not only responsible. Here, let me get this a little bit bigger for you so it's a little bit easier reading. There we go. Okay. So uh, plate tectonics are not only responsible for mountains and the movement of the continents, they are also responsible for volcanoes. Volcanoes usually result from one of two plate configurations. They form in places where the plates are colliding or where the plates are pulling apart. In the first case, the plates come together pushing against each other, causing friction and heat, which allows some of the crust material to melt resulting in liquid magma. Because magma is less dense than the surrounding rock, it ends up rising to the surface where it becomes a volcano. An example of this type of volcano is the famous Mount Vesuvius, which destroyed the city of Pompeii in 79 CE. The second type of volcano comes from divergent plates. These types tend to be underwater as in the mid-oceanic ridges. Uh, volcanic islands such as Iceland and Hawaii were formed by underwater volcanic activity, eventually spewing off enough matter to form land above water. What is this paragraph about? I bet many of you uh, will get this. Kaldeep says, it's the formation of volcanoes. So, okay, Kaldeep, I like it. It's volcanoes. So it's um, what volcanoes are. It's about volcanoes, right? Very good, call deep. Uh, so which one of these choices is the closest match to uh, volcanoes? Okay, we looked at this. Which one of these is the closest match to volcanoes? I bet many of you will get it because we looked at list of headings prior to reading. So what is the correct Answer. Prathamesh says it's the Roman numeral I, number one. Yeah, I agree. This is a descriptive definition of volcanoes. 
violent eruptions, magma, lava, new islands. New islands was um, Hawaii, New Zealand, right? Uh, destruction of Pompeii, it's no good. Okay, be really careful with that because that's just an example. That's not what the paragraph is about. It's not about the destruction of Pompeii. It doesn't, uh, for it to be about number two, the paragraph would have to say um, back in, I don't know the time, back in 200 BC, uh, the famous city of Pompeii, a thriving metropolis of the Roman Empire, uh, was destroyed by a volcanic eruption. 80% of the citizens of Pompeii were buried under uh, five meters of hot volcanic ash. Then it would be about the city of Pompeii, but it's not giving us all this information. It's just saying that one example of uh, volcanic eruption was Mount Vesuvius destroying Pompeii. So it's not number two because that's an example. Okay, Nico, you're never looking for an example. They always try to get you with at least one of these types of example situations. So be really careful about that. Okay, so it's not that one. It's number one, volcanic eruptions, volcanoes, okay? All right. Uh, so last paragraph, paragraph G. Here we go. Uh, of course, there is one final important result of plate tectonics, earthquakes. Earthquakes are perhaps the most terrifying of all natural disasters. They are practically invisible. They happen below the Earth's surface and have devastating results. Earthquakes happen along fault lines, places where two plates are colliding, diverging, or slipping past each other. In the case where the two plates are attempting to slip past each other, the most devastating earthquakes can occur. This is because friction does not allow the plates to pass each other until sufficient energy to counteract the resistance has been built up. So the two plates rub against each other for centuries or millennia until one day they finally slip. This slip is what results in a sudden catastrophic earthquake. If this slip occurs in the ocean underneath the Earth's surface, it can cause a massive tidal wave known as a tsunami. If this slip occurs directly beneath a major city, massive destruction will result. There are many such cities at risk of these earthquakes, many of them along what is known as the Ring of Fire, surrounding the Pacific Ocean. These cities include Tokyo, San Francisco, Vancouver, and Santiago. Understanding plate tectonics reveals that it is not a question of if these major cities will get hit by an earthquake. It is only a question of when. Okay, um, what is this paragraph about? So, very clear. Um, again, paragraph F was about volcanoes, and if paragraph F was about volcanoes, then this paragraph was about one word answer. <laughs> I think many of you will get this. Okay, again, don't overthink it. Um, one of the quote unquote tricks to list of headings is do not overthink it. Just be really concise. Uh, at times, you can explain what the paragraph is about in a single word. Okay. Yeah, very good, Prathamesh. So Prathamesh says earthquakes. Yeah, Rashika agrees. Earthquakes. Okay, so we're looking for earthquake in our choices. And here are our choices. Um, where do we see earthquake? Okay, Honey agrees that it's earthquake. So where do we see earthquake? Where do we see earthquake? I don't see the word earthquake anywhere. So if I don't see the word earthquake, I'm looking for uh, some kind of a paraphrase. And the paraphrase is often a descriptive definition. Okay. Um, and Rashika and Honey both agree that it's the invisible threat. That's right. It's because an earthquake is the threat, the danger, right? Threat means danger that we do not see. I agree. So all of you have it. Okay. So that's the descriptive definition. And that's my last tip for today. Okay. So, um, when you do not see the, uh, direct answer, for example, uh, earthquake, look for the descriptive 
definition. Okay, uh, for example, the invisible threat. All right, that's how that works. So that's what you want to do in your exam, Nico. All right, everyone. Okay, so um, true, false, not given, and uh, the uh, matching sentence endings, you can do that on your own. Again, this is uh, paragraph uh, reading, sorry, reading passage two from exam number one on our website. Um, if you have access to that, great. If not, members, you can just look at this video again. Try these answers on your own. Send me the answers and I'll send you an answer key. If you have the reading uh, passage, if you have access to our premium package, uh, also do the reading audio, okay? So practice with the reading audio. It's really, really great practice. Uh, for those of our viewers who would like to get a lifetime access for a one-time uh, payment, not a lot of money, um, then definitely visit us for general IELTS. It's this website here. You're going to find, of course, general outs, reading passages. Click that big red button to join our premium package there. And for the academic uh, to find this reading passage and others like it, uh, it's the blue background at ahelp.com. And you want to click that big red button uh, to join the premium package there. All right, everyone. Uh, that's it for now. But I am back in 30 minutes uh, with some listening. Okay, so we're going to do... Uh, practice listening from one of our exams. Uh, we're going to do uh, parts one and two. Uh, that's coming up in half an hour. You're very, very welcome, Rashika. Uh, thank you for those of you who are waking up early in the mornings to join these classes. I appreciate that. And hopefully I see all of you in 30 minutes for listening, practice, and strategy. I'm Adrian signing out for now from Victoria, but I will be back soon. Bye.